my heart, I pray that your will be done. Till I see you face to face, and grace amazing takes me home, trust in you.
Live to live. 
Good morning, Trinity Church. Can I ask you all to stand with me? If you are able, kids are already standing. Would you pray with me? God, I'm not going to pretend to uh, to know that I know exactly what it is that you uh, want to do today. I just want to be like an instrument in your hands, just like I'm holding this instrument in my hands. I want to be like an instrument in your hands. God, would you play your song uh, through, through me, through us? Would you play your song through... Um, Everything that happens with the kids and their teachers and all, this, all the things that they're going to learn. Would you play your song through every part of what we do here today? That it would be a blessing, that we would be uplifted, and that in some way we would take a step closer to, to knowing this Jesus. This Jesus that, that said he loved us so much that he would come and be with us. We would take steps closer to knowing this Jesus who calls us to love, love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength and love each other as we love ourselves. Help us to take our steps closer to knowing Jesus today as we worship you, as we sing, as we hear um, scripture, as we learn, as we listen, as we share. Lord, do what you want to do with us today because I know whatever it is, you love us and it's going to be good. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing.
trust you.
stone is rolled away. And I thank you, God, that you've done that already so that um, you could pay the price, the penalty for, um, for all of the sin in this world, Lord. But, Lord, help us to follow you wherever you lead, whatever that looks like, Lord God, for us in our own journey, in our own life. Help us to follow you, man of sorrows, lamb of God. Thank you for your love for us, Lord, that's poured out on us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. 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 You may be seated. Kids, once again, always good to have you with us. You know what? I want to take a cue. Hang on, kids. Hang on for me. I want to take a cue from Pastor Christine, something she did last week. Um, can everybody just kind of extend a hand to the middle right now? We're just going to pray over these kids as they go. Um, we're going to pray for you, kids, because we love you. And we want to ask God to bless your time as you, uh, as you learn in your classes. So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for these kids and everything that they're learning and all the ways that they're growing, Lord God. Um, Lord, I pray that they would walk away today knowing, God, that you love them, that they are loved, that there is, that there is um, this God somewhere, even if we cannot taste or touch or smell or, or feel, God, but, but we um, want them to know, God, that you love them today. That they, would, that they would experience that love today and help them to learn and enjoy and just know that this is a place where they are welcome and that they matter. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll see you soon. Well, my name is uh, Johnny. I'm the campus pastor here at our Monterey Park campus. We have another campus over in Roland Heights and just happened, so happened to have our campus pastor from Roland Heights with us today preaching, Pastor Christine. We're really glad to have her. It's a treat to have her um, when we get to have her here because she's not often here. A um, few announcements I want to share with you. Uh, first of all, we are um, always looking for ways to connect. So please uh, fill out a connection card. If we don't have your contact information, we'd love to know how to keep you in the loop with things that are happening. And if this is your first time here, or it's your first time in a long time, um, we have a newcomer package that we want to give you. It comes with a t-shirt, and it comes with a USB drive with some songs on it. So, um, and then you can use the USB drive for whatever you want, so that's a cool gift, right? Um, so if you haven't gotten that, please stop by our welcome kiosk on the way out the door here, and uh, Laura or somebody who's there with a smiley, friendly face will hook you up. All right, 
next. And we want to make sure that you know that we have our community groups are going to be looking different this time around. Sometimes community groups focus like they did in the winter time. They focus on outreach and doing things in the community together. And sometimes our community groups are going to focus on just studying the word of God together, the Bible, and worshiping together. And so this time around, starting on July 19th, or July, uh, the women are going to start on July 12th, men are starting July 19th. Um, we're going to start um, with some small group times. The women are doing a, a group called Breaking Free, and also um, they have a, a group called GIG, which is a Groups Investigating God, and that's for people who are new in their faith or still kind of exploring what the Bible and God and Jesus are all about, and so you can go and ask questions, and it's been a really great time. I'd love uh, for you to, uh, to talk to uh, a couple of our people who are in that class, that, in that group, and they, they love it. Also, men's, we have a couple of men's groups that are starting up. And so if you want to just kind of have a way of connecting um, and, and just kind of learning the Bible together, worshiping together um, for a few weeks, uh, we would like to invite you to be part of that. So please check it out if you have not already. Um, our uh, de denomination called the Church of the Nazarene, um, you know, there's like Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, that kind of thing. Well, we are the Church of the Nazarene. That's the denomination that we are a part, this church is a part of. Um, and the Church of the Nazarene every year has an assembly of all of the churches within the LA district. Um, and so all the churches from the LA district, which is all the way up in New Hall, all the way down to like Orange County or just above Orange County, um, all of the ch Nazarene churches within that district come together to find out what's happening in our district and some of the good things that are happening, some of the challenges that we face. And so that's happening Wednesday, July 12th through Friday, July 14th. Um, if you can't make it to all of that, which likely you can't, probably the best time to go would be Thursday night, which is when they have a um, a uh, time of singing, and you get to hear from the district superintendent of the LA district, which is um, the guy who oversees all of the d churches in this district. Um, and that's also the time when they ordain the, uh, the pastors who are, who are getting ordained. And so it's just a special time, and it's a, t it, it, it's a chance for you to find out, if you're curious, what is the Church of the Nazarene all about? What is this, what's this thing like? Um, what's our goal in this? You can find out more about that. Um, we also have uh, this coming Friday, July 14th, is an outdoor worship time. Um, we are, have invited uh, a guest uh, worship leader to come and, and lead us in some songs, and many of them will be familiar to you. If you um, join us on Sundays regularly, you'll know a lot of the songs that we're going to sing, um, but it'll be just a really great time for us to sing some songs and praise under the stars. I don't know about you, but I like doing things under the stars, uh, sleeping, watching movies, camping, uh, you know, things, and so... We get to worship under the stars, which is really cool. Um, there's also going to be food provided, um, and it's going to be a really great time to just be together as a church family. So please join us for that. And then the following week, um, we are going to be going to uh, Sequoia Park, which is right here in Monterey Park. Um, and they're going to be showing uh, Lego Batman. That sounds like fun. Have anybody ever seen Lego Batman? Only one person has seen Lego? Three people? OK. I heard it's really fun, so I plan to, to be there with my kids. It's a really great, so if, if you have like friends that you never get to hang out with because you're always so busy, this might be a really great time to just say, hey, we're going to the park, we're gonna watch a movie. Because people watch movies with their kids anyway at some point and you gotta eat. So just bring your food, sit in the park, eat your dinner, watch a movie and be with your friends. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, you don't even have to be a kid. You could just be like, like me, like a big kid at heart and just go watch Lego Batman. All right, I want to invite Pastor Christine up, and she is going to uh, share something with us. Okay, in the Roland Heights campus, we are going to have a talent night. It's going to be an outside concert, and there are three reasons why we're having this. This Roland Heights Got Talent. First reason, we want to bring the community onto our campus. So we're going to be handing these out, uh, coffee shops or wherever, trying to get people um, to come and perform on our outside stage and to bring uh, guests onto our campus as well. That's the first reason. Second reason is because uh, this is a fundraiser for our women's retreat. We really want every woman on both campuses to participate on our women's retreat, which is coming on November 3rd to 5th. We are doing it at a hotel. Uh, a lot of women will not be able to afford it, and we do not want women to miss out because they can't afford it. So this is going to be a fundraiser. If you would like to help on that event, come see me, come see Carol, um, Joanne, anyone that's on the women's team. The third reason is this. 
Ever since we uh, have been talking about uh, Pastor Albert and I being sent to NorCal, the board has been really emphasizing the need for our church to feel like one church. And so this is a project where both campuses are gonna be invited to attend, to help out. And Albert and I were discussing one of the signs that we'll truly know that we are one church is if one campus comes over to the other campus to help serve there. If we see 80% of you over at Roland Heights, if we see 80% of the Roland Heights over on this campus to help out an event, then we could say we are truly one church. So let's celebrate our identity as one church. Let's really just come together for this event. Uh, I have eight by 11 sheets. If anybody wants to grab some and uh, like post it up on public message boards or coffee shops, that would be great. We have a couple hundred of these for you to take and give out to your friends, which is at the welcome kiosk. That would be awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. So you see a snapshot of our church calendar there, all the things that are happening that we just talked about. So make sure to put some of those things on your calendar, especially August 5th. Now, before we go to the next slide, um, I would like to ask uh, Janelle and your, and your mom, would you please, would you please stand? And uh, Janelle, you are uh, without your, your husband today, Sam. But we wanted to recognize, because, da, 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 coming this Thanksgiving, Yao Baby, the sequel. We want to say congratulations to Sam and Janelle, and congratulations, Grandma. Um, yeah, we're really excited for you, so welcome. Uh, we're, we're, we'll be excited to welcome your, your baby. Congratulations. Yeah. We love you guys. We are excited when babies get born. It's just a, it's a, it's a happy time for us. We love babies. Um, I am going to uh, pass it back over to you for offertory. So take it away. So we are going to transition for a time of offering. Um, I think one thing that's on my heart today Sometimes we can catch ourselves worshiping, singing uh, our worship songs without really thinking about the words. You know, we're thinking about what we're going to have for lunch that day or somebody's cute shoes that's sitting on the aisle across from us. And, and sometimes we're not really engaged in the words that we're actually singing to our Father God. And I find that offering is like that as well. That we do it without thinking, we do it out of practice and routine. And today, I want to encourage all of us, when we give, whether it is online automatically, whether it is out of our pocketbooks now, that we take the time and thank the Lord for his provision and say, God, thank you for this opportunity to give, up, to give back, I mean. So let's do this as an act of worship. I want to uh, also, next slide, there is another way or a way that we have been giving already. If you text TCMP to 77977, it is a fast and secure way of giving. If you are on vacation sometime and you still want to give your uh, tithe um, and, and you want to do it on the road, well, no. Don't text while you're driving. If you want to pass it to the person beside you and they want to give an offering, do that as well. And so saying that, if the ushers can come forward, let's uh, stand up for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him Father God, I pray, Lord, as we write out in our checkbooks, as we physically put something onto the offering plate, that that may be a gesture of thanksgiving to you, God, for the ways that you have provided in our lives, 
that that may be a gesture of faith, Lord, that your hand will always provide. God, I pray, Lord, that you anoint every dollar that's in the plate that has gone through, uh, through the internet, Father God. Lord, that you bless these funds to bless other people, God, for the women's retreat, for the youth missions trip, Lord, for our children's program. Lord, in every way that, that this money is used, Lord, bless it to honor and glorify you, Lord. Just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody, this is Jen, in case you've never met her. Uh, she and her husband, David, uh, joined us a few months ago. We're really glad to have them. And uh, she and I are going to share this, uh, this song with you. This is a new song. As you learn it, we just invite you to really let these words sink into your heart, and whether it's with your voice, with your body, with whatever you feel comfortable. Um, if all you can do is just lift up in a silent prayer, we invite you in that space now.
Please stay exactly where you are. Don't move. Don't feel like you need to get up. Don't feel like you need to say hi to anybody. But if you are not an introvert, if you are an extrovert, go ahead and get up and say hi to people. And if the people who are sitting look at you and smile, then you can say hi to them. But if they avoid eye contact, then be a little gentler with them, okay? Try to, try to be sensitive, all right? <clears throat> so go ahead and only extroverts get up, and there may be only be like three of us, but then you just have more to do. Okay, so extroverts get up, go say hi, introverts stay where you are. I want to celebrate everyone's differences. Okay, if we could all be seated. And let's start, as we traditionally do, by reading the communal prayer together. O Lord, our God, you have chosen to make yourself known through your creation, your word, your Son, and your Spirit. Now reveal your glory to us and through us, the Church. Speak to us, form us, lead us, dwell in us. Teach us today how to love as Jesus loves, to welcome the stranger, heal the sick, and care for the poor, to bear good news, build bridges, and bring your people home. For Christ in us is the hope of glory. May your perfect will prevail in us to say, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. And if I may add to that prayer. Father God, I pray that you fill every corner, every mind, every heart with your spirits today. God, give us ears to hear, Lord, the message that you have for us. May it not be of me, Lord, but of you. God, as you speak to us, as you form us, as you lead us and dwell in us today, we just pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So this morning we are on part six of a sermon series called We Are Family. And I think it has been a very convicting series because I've been hearing from some of you that you don't even want to come to church anymore because you are sitting in your seat and you're squirming, thinking, oh great, the pastor is talking about me again. And I have to say that it has been just as convicting for the pastors as well to write it. The Lord did quite a number on me this week. There has been many tears shed as I researched and meditated upon our topic for today. And I'm afraid I'm going to be breaking the golden rule of preaching, which is never use the pulpit as your confessional. And uh, I think I may break that a little bit, so here we go. In this series so far, we've been talking about how to be empathetic, how to let go of our bitterness. We've been talking about how to fight well, among some other topics. And this morning, we will be discussing how to confront in love and be reconciled with one another. How do we have difficult conversations with the people we love in a way that enriches our relationships and helps us to reflect the love of God? How do we rise above those ugly, painful feelings and move towards reconciliation and harmony? Perhaps the Holy Spirit has already taken a hold of your heart and he's bringing to mind broken relationships in your life. And I encourage you, don't push those thoughts away. Perhaps the Lord is going to do a mighty work in your heart today. That rhymed. So as we have mentioned in this series, as Christians, we should be really good at doing relationships. We should be awesome. We should be reflecting the patience and the goodness and the long-suffering of Jesus Christ in our relationships. Church, have we been good at this so far? Frank Carver says in his commentary on 2 Corinthians, he says this, the divine dimension, not common tastes and preferences or compatible personalities, constitute human relationships as truly Christian. When we love well the people that we get along with, the people that we are compatible with, this is all good. But when we choose to love, and love with the love of Jesus, the people we are not inclined to get along with, now that reflects the spirit of Christian relationship. So to learn how to confront in love, we're going to do a quick study on Paul the Apostle, who was exemplary at confronting in love, as we can see in his epistles. So Paul, through these letters, he, he has difficult conversations where he rebukes, corrects, encourages, and reconciles with his people in his care. And particularly in the book of 2 Corinthians, we see Paul's heart. He reveals the, part, the heart of a pastor. Paul is deeply committed in his, to his people, and he exemplifies a crucified and resurrected character in his relationships. Pastors, lay people, this is the love. This is the commitment we should have with one another. So before I read an excerpt from 2 Corinthians, I want to do a quick background of what's going on here. So Paul, he's traveling in his uh, missionary journeys, and he's planting churches along the way. And he plants a church in Corinth during one of these trips, and then he lives there for about a year and a half, and then returns to Ephesus. And in his absence, these Corinthians are led astray. So Paul writes a letter, a uh, letter that we know, we know as 1 Corinthians, to address this and other matters, but then he receives a report. 
a report that the conditions of the church is even worse than before. So Paul travels back to Corinth, the church that he planted, and he visits with them. And he calls it a very painful visit. Because a ringleader of sorts rises up against Paul, and his beloved church stands on the side of the attacker. So Paul returns to Ephesus. He's hurt. He's humiliated. But then scholars say, in between 1 and 2 Corinthians, there's a couple of more letters that he writes. And he's comforted with the news that the Corinthians have admitted to their wrong, and they are wanting to restore their relationship with Paul, their pastor. But there's still accusations out there, severe criticisms against Paul. Right? There, there is uh, outsiders questioning Paul's integrity, his spiritual authority. So he writes his church another letter, which we call 2 Corinthians. So as a pastor, I can only imagine the pain that he felt. He plants a church. He grows to love them like his own children. He lives in their midst for about a year and a half, and then they betray him. They betray him. His spiritual family turns against him, allowing others to criticize his ministry and question his integrity. The church that Paul cherished and loved. And I imagine just how many times he has been crying just at the feet of Jesus, praying out to him, God, give me wisdom. God, give me humility. God, lead me in these ways. So let's see how he responds. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 10. Okay, 2 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 10. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have exploited no one. I do not say this to condemn you. I have said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would die or live or die with you. I have spoken to you with great frankness. I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged in all our troubles. May joy know no bounds. For when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside, fears within. But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concerns for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sor sorrowful as God intended, and we were not harmed in any way by us, and so were not harmed. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. So here in these 10 verses, the way that Paul approaches his letter to the Corinthians, we can glean some principles that Paul uses for our own relationships. And I think if we take these principles to heart, we can demonstrate Christ's love in our relationships. And I. As I go through these principles, it might be easy for us to like kind of point a finger at other people and say, mm-hmm. 
but I encourage each of us to really look deep within the areas that the Lord wants to grow ourselves. So, four principles of confronting in love. Four principles of confronting in love. First of all, it's not about you, it's about Christ in you. It's the first principle. So verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friend, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. So before a very moving appeal for full restoration, Paul reminds them the true purpose of why they need to be reconciled. The true purpose. We need to deal with the broken relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ so that we can be purified and so that we can perfect holiness out of reverence for God. So the chapter right before this, Paul asked the Corinthians in verse 14 to 16, he asked the Corinthians these questions. What do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. So Paul is saying that we should have nothing in common with wickedness, with darkness, with unbelievers, with idols. And then Paul quotes from the Old Testament where God says to his people, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And God promises, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So touch no unclean thing. Be holy. Purify yourselves from anything that defiles your heart, your mind, your spirit. So let me ask you, right now in your life, what broken relationship is causing sin in your heart today? And here are some questions I would like us to reflect on. What are you allowing to fester? What am I, sorry, what am I allowing to fester in my thoughts, motives, and feelings? Does this action or thought defile or contaminate me? Does it harm me physically? And does it darken my mind and heart? Has it left me feeling unkind, small, dirty, or estranged? Any of these kinds of thoughts or attitudes or actions, these emotions is not to be touched or admitted into our lives. Touch no unclean thing. In the Old Testament, the people of God, they were commanded to go to the temple and be purified through these strict rituals and offerings so that they can remain in covenant with their God. But Paul says here that we are now the temples of the living God. How is this possible? It is only through Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, that purifies us. And the Holy Spirit lives in his people, lives in us, making us the temples of the living God. Christ in us. No more rituals or offerings. It's just an embracing of Christ's righteousness for ourselves in us. And this 
This is why we must be reconciled with each other. You know, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about being purified out of the reverence for God, our Father. It's about Christ in us. So what are the reasons we neglect to restore our broken relationships? What are the reasons for that? Was it anger or pride, hurt, maybe even laziness? Is it fear? Have you dismissed these relationships as being not important? Have you written these relationships off because you're, you're afraid to be disappointed again? This is not about us. It's about Christ in us who forgave our sins and gave us the ability to forgive others. So I want to pause here to describe for a moment um, a hurt that Albert and I have been feeling lately. So it's come to our attention that a small handful of people have been having some pretty negative thoughts about us taking the call um, in Northern California as district superintendent. And some of these comments that are being made are things like, oh, you know, come on, tell us the truth. You're happy that you're leaving. Or, uh, you know, Albert, you're p playing chess the whole time, being strategic, this whole merge, everything, so that you can um, vie for that position as DS. You know, some other comments, you know, Albert, your true colors have come out. And some other comments that I don't want to get into. But basically, it's like, you know what? You can go. What have you done for us? What have they done for us lately anyways? And honestly, in the past 13 years of ministry, it is probably the most hurtful, uh, the most pain that Albert and I have felt because of ministry. But being in that place, We've just felt this urgency from the Lord and say, he's saying to us now, especially now, don't let bitterness and resentment take root in your heart, especially during this transition. You know, I want to say God as my witness, the only reason that we are leaving Trinity is because we strongly believe that the Lord is sending us. God as my witness, Albert nor I have ever once, not even once, even entertained the idea of being DS any time in our future. God as my witness, both Albert and I are heartbroken about leaving you, our Trinity family. We're very heartbroken about it. And God is telling us, Christine, Albert, love and embrace deeply before you go. He's convicted us to keep our church pure from any thoughts of bitterness and anger. You know, to stand united in love with each other, with you, so that Satan cannot get a foothold. One of the lessons God taught me this week is not to let my own hurt take priority over the unity of the church. You know, something that I have failed a number of times in my ministry here. And for that, I ask for forgiveness. You know, it's not about me. It's not about my hurt. It's not about Albert. It's not about you. It is about Christ in us, that in the cross, in Jesus Christ, that we have unity as the body of Christ, and we are commanded to keep that pure and holy. And God is good. He has sent me a number of you this week to minister to my heart, and I really thank God for that. So that is one. It's not about you. It's about Christ in you. Second principle. Examining your own heart comes first. In verse 2, Paul says, we wronged no one, we corrupted no one, we took advantage of no one. I do not speak to condemn you. Paul's conscience, he, it is clear. He's examined his own heart. 
any unjust action or any ill will or misdemeanor to the Corinthians. He has asked, Lord, examine my heart. Is there any wrong in me? And Paul's conscience is clear. He's even reflected on his motivation of confronting the Corinthians. I do not speak to condemn you or accuse. He doesn't write his church to make them feel bad or to get his point across or to right a wrong. Even in his motivation, Paul, his conscience is clear. So before we confront anyone, we need to get these two things right. First of all, examine your heart. Take ownership of the wrongdoing that you have done. And how do you do this? Maybe before you start this conversation, you ask them, is there anything that I have done or said or anything that I have not done or not said that has hurt you? Please describe that for me and listen to them. Don't get defensive. And believe me, I know how hard this is. You know, our emotional baggage and our insecurities, our self-doubt, our personal hurts, it's a screaming, defend yourself, protect your heart. Keep your eyes on their sin, not our own. In our broken relationships, what personal wrong are we not acknowledging? This is what we should be asking. And the second thing, examine your motivation. Right? We need to have the right motives. Are we confronting to feel better about ourselves? To get something off our chest? To get the other person to admit they're wrong and how they have hurt them, hurt us? Are we trying to embarrass them or make them feel ashamed? You know, Albert, I have to admit, confessional, he's the first to say sorry almost every single time. And I have to say, why are you sorry? You know, I have to have him fully understand how he has hurt me. It's not about me. It is not about me. It is Christ in me. Are we trying to make them feel ashamed and admit their wrongs? Or are we merely trying to love them fully, remove any of those barriers and restore them, restore the relationship. And we have to be very shrewd in this self-examining. It's so easy to convince ourselves that our motives are pure. You know, I had a friend, uh, I had a falling out with a friend once, and I confronted her with something that I thought uh, was not right. And I confronted her, and, and, and I prayed about it. And, and I, I asked for wisdom for, from the Lord, and, and I tried to be gentle. And I thought I was being so gentle, so wise, and so kind. I thought so, but my friend did not. She was hurt deeply by my words, you know? Her hurt translated to anger, which then in turn hurt me. And I wrestled with God. God, what? You know, I, I just felt so, so much that I was like uh, just, just ministering to her and helping her in this way. And, and, and this anger is turned to me. And, and I said, Lord, give me the humility to restore this relationship. And we've made a couple of more attempts to restore what was lost that day but failed. She was upset. I was upset. In our Christian way, we decided just to let it go, and we remained fairly good friends. I thought I did my best. You know, I thought I was being humble, you know, die to myself, live for Christ. And this week, for a little bit of uh, research, and because the Lord had convicted my heart so much, I called her up and I said, tell me, tell me one more time, how did I hurt you? What posture, what attitude, what words hurt you? And in her grace, 
she lovingly and gently pointed out what I did to hurt her. I had prioritized the message over the person. Right? Showing her my perception of right and wrong came before really, truly understanding her hurt and her pain. At the time, I would have dug my heels in and said otherwise, that, that, that I really was putting the person first. But looking back and really reflecting, the Lord showed me my wrong. And I want to uh, explain to you why this was so difficult to me. Not, not to excuse myself, but to make a point on how our own past and our own baggage gives us such limited scopes of our blind spots. You know, I've shared at the pulpit a number of times my past of sexual abuse. And I think because of this experience, I have a very heightened awareness of what is right and wrong. And I have a strong need to wrong that right. And this becomes even more obsessive when I feel like I am being wronged, or worse yet, the people I love are being wronged. And so I put my sense of propriety above, above my care for the person, but it's so, in such a subtle way that it takes me a while to see it. For example, Albert and I will get into a fight because he's overworked and stressed and he's got a gazillion deadlines that, I haven't, that he hasn't been able to reach. And he attacks me or says something that is so incredibly unfair and I hold on to that and I get upset. He says, sorry, oh, but Albert, you really wronged me without caring for his stress, his hurt, right? I'm putting what was right and wrong above my care for what was going on in his life. Do we put our message above the person? In what ways does your past keep you from seeing those unhealthy patterns that you have in your relationships? It's a very painful process, this discovery, this self-discovery, you know, but it's much needed. In Psalms 139, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. May this be our prayer. Okay, third principle. Commitment to the relationship is key. In verse 2, Paul pleads with his church, make room for us in your hearts. And then he goes on to say, you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die with you. And he says in a previous chapter, he says, Oh, Corinthians, our hearts are opened wide. Paul is committed to the relationship. Even after his hurt and betrayal and the disloyalty and the accusations, he is not going anywhere. How committed are we to our relationships with our family and our friends, with our church? Are we committed through thick and thin? Are our hearts fully wide open or are we holding back? I know it's scary sometimes. It's scary when we've been hurt in the past so badly that we don't want to risk being hurt again. You know, Paul was hurt badly, yet Christ in him gave Paul the ability to forgive and open his heart wide. And I believe that Christ can do that for you and me as well. So in the NIV, it says that the Corinthians had such a place in Paul's heart that he would live or die with them. In the NASB, however, it says that the Corinthians were in his heart to die together and to live together, right? Die first and then live. Why am I pointing this out? 
I think it's powerful the way that the NASB have it, has it. In our earthly existence, we first live and then we die. But in our spiritual existence, we die first and then we live. We die to ourselves and live in Christ. And as redeemed people, we can commit to each other like this, can we not? That we die together by proclaiming the work of the cross for ourselves, where our old selves are dead. And in Christ, we can commit to live together in freedom, in forgiveness by the blood of, the, of Christ. Is there possibly a hurt in the world that the cross cannot overcome? We are to love, and we are to love extravagantly with our hearts open wide. This is a mark of a Christian. Now let's not deceive ourselves and tell ourselves, you know what, that broken relationship, that has nothing to do with my relationship with God. It absolutely does. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Commit to the relationship. So I re recently had a thing with another friend here at church. I have a slew of stories of how I have not loved well. And thank goodness to the Lord in his mercy and grace, he sees, he lets me see some of the good that I've done or else I would have quit ministry a long time ago. But saying that ministry is ugly sometimes, it's messy sometimes, because it involves broken, imperfect people like myself. I was going through some major anxieties about leaving Trinity, and I was frustrated that the women's ministry was not going a certain direction. Uh, I'm usually meticulous when I write emails out of frustration. I'll pray about it and pray about it, and I'll craft my email, and then I'll show Albert, and Albert will always say, don't put that there, that sounds snarky, don't use capitalized letters, <laughs> whatever, and then I'll fix it and pray about it, and then I'll send it off. I'm usually good at that, but this time I was not. And in my frustration, I wrote this email, and I knew that I should read it over again. I just closed my eyes and clicked on the send button. So because of that, I unintentionally hurt someone from that email group. It was a group of women. And, um, and, and this someone wasn't even the cause of most of my frustration, but it was very reasonable for her to come to the conclusion that that frustration was uh, fueled towards her. And it all came to a head at one of the core meetings, and there were th these bad feelings came out, and uh, there were tears. But thankfully, there was also reconciliation and restoration. I'm thankful for this friend, Molly, I'm thankful because she received my messy apology. I'm thankful that she didn't write me off. And in fact, she drew closer to me. She drew closer and said, Christine, I would love to meet regularly with you. Now that's commitment to the relationship. And she's not here today, but I'm sure she'll be listening online soon enough. Thank you, Molly. Okay, that's principle three. Commitment to the relationship is key. A fourth point. Remorse is not the same as repentance. Remorse is not the same as repentance. We need to confront those people that we love that in a way that encourages them to repent and not be remorseful. Paul says in the letter that he rejoiced that the Corinthians were moved to repentance. He regretted that his last letter caused sorrow, but was also rejoicing that their sorrow was according to the will of God. And in verse 10, it says, For that sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. It was a difficult letter for Paul to write. He says, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not so that you would be made sorrowful, 
but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. So this goes back to examining your motives for this confrontation. Is it for them to feel sorrow just so that you could feel better? Or are you confronting out of concern for their spiritual well-being? So do you want them to feel repent, repentful, repentant, or remorseful? Repentant or remorseful? Let's look at the difference. So remorse, metamelomai in the original Greek. This kind of sorrow causes a change of mood or feelings. So there's guilt and it's heavy and it kind of drives you to a darker place. For example, Judas was remorseful for betraying Jesus. And that incredible amount of guilt and shame led him to death, literally. Right? Judas hangs himself in his sorrow. That's remorse. But repentance, metanoia, this sorrow causes a change of heart and thus a change in behavior. So rather than an emotional response, it's a spiritual response. So for example, G Peter as well, he betrayed the Lord, but he felt repentant. His sorrow led him back to the Lord, and he found joy in his salvation. So when you confront someone, words really matter. What words will you choose? They can bring life, or they can bring death to their spirit. Does it draw them closer to the Lord to a dark, or to a darker place of despair? Correct an older man in a way that shows respect. Make an appeal to him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as if they were your brothers. Treat older women as if they were your mothers. Treat younger women as if they were your sisters. Be completely pure in the way you treat them. It makes me think about the way that I discipline, especially this one over here, right? Because sometimes, when I discipline him, I feel like it makes him angry and it draws him away from light and goodness. I need to learn as a mother how to discipline in him that convicts him and draws him closer to the Lord. We have to learn that as parents. If we treat people with dignity and love, our confrontations should make them feel convicted. I need to right this wrong, not condemned. I am something wrong. Of course, there are exceptions. You know, sometimes a person's brokenness is so deep that it doesn't allow them to hear with an open heart. But even then, we must strive to minister to them in that brokenness. Last week, Pastor Albert gave some practical rules of engagement in, these, in having these difficult conversations and how to avoid certain pitfalls that kill the relationship. And if you've missed it, I encourage you to listen to the sermon series online. I'd like to end with a story, one last story to encourage you. So when I was about 30 years old, uh, the person that um, victimized me as a child, he approached me and he asked for forgiveness. He came to me and, and the guilt and the shame that he was feeling was just too much for him to bear. And he asked for forgiveness. And I sat there, I took a moment. And I considered all the pain and brokenness that resulted from his offense against me. You know, it affected the way I saw myself. It affected my relationships. It affected my marriage. It even affected my relationship with God. All these ways. But I looked at him 
And suddenly I just felt God's peace just wash over me. I felt a deep pity and even compassion for this person. And I forgave him. I even prayed over him. And I asked God to purify his heart, to purify his hands, to purify his mind. And he wept and wept. And I truly believe God used my words to draw him into repentance, and not with me, but repentance with the Lord. You see, even in that place, that broken place of my pain and my deep shame, you know, that, that, that broken place that probably most defiled and twisted my self-identity as a daughter of God, even in that place, it's not about me. It's about Christ in me. I pray that God's peace will flow in those dark places for you. I'm praying that there is healing and wholeness so that God can use you to restore and rebuild the relationships, the relationships around you, the relationships between people and God. And I'm praying that as a church, that each and every one of us, that we are striving to keep our relationships holy and pure. So who did the Lord bring to your mind today? What brother or sister? Keep that person in mind while I pray for us. Father God, this is a theme that, that keeps returning for me and it's coming up in my sermons all the time, but we are the body of Christ. We are the temples of the living God. You choose to dwell in us, Lord. What a beautiful thing that is. And how much does the enemy want to break that unity apart? that he wants to destroy relationships. But God, you know how hard it is. It's not easy just to let go of the hurt and pain in our lives. Father, you know this. Which is the reason why you give us the Holy Spirit. God, I'm praying for every broken heart out there right now. Those hearts that feel anger and bitterness, resentment. Those hearts that have been so used to holding that pain in their hearts, not letting go, where it's festering, causing harm to us, even physically, spiritually that I pray that you put balm on those areas Lord your healing balm Father the hole that 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 darkness has in those places Lord I pray that you release it by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is not from our own abilities, Lord. It is you, Father God, in your goodness and in your power and in your desire to set us free, Lord. It is you, 
Father God. Our hearts of stone, Lord, I pray that you change them to hearts of flesh. Soften those hardened areas, Lord. Allow the spirit of forgiveness, the spirit of mercy, the spirit of compassion flow in those places, Lord. Let us be a people that restore, rebuild, renew all those broken places, Lord. Proclaim words of healing in those places, God. We thank you for your faithfulness and goodness and forgiveness of our sins for your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray for all these things in Jesus' name. prayed for uh, this message this week and how we could respond uh, with this final song. Uh, I just kept coming back to, God, we need help to let go of this uh, bitterness that sometimes sits in us, the uh, resentments that we have, um, the things that cause us to not be able to love well and often to not confront well. Um, we, just, we need God's help. I need God's help. I want to invite you right now as we sing this song, um, however you need to posture yourself, if, if anything that Christine has shared has spoken to you, God has spoken to you through this, if you've been kind of something tugging on your heart, that something that you need to let go of, or that God is really calling you to, to be healed in some way, um, any bitterness or resentment that you have allowed to infest your heart. As we sing, if... If you just need to sit and, and let the Lord speak to you or pour out your heart to God, just do that. If you want to get on your knees, uh, do that. If you want to stand and raise your hands, then I encourage you to do that. If you want to come <clears throat> up to this center section and just, just kind of use this space as, a, as an altar, as a, as a place to just bow. If you want to come here at this altar area right here and bow, if, if you... Um, are being led to weep, then weep. If you are being led to sing out, then sing out. Whatever the Lord is putting in your heart to do right now, don't resist that. Because I, I believe that some of you are really are convicted right now of what the Lord is saying to you, and I just want to give you the space to do that. As we sing this song that just says, Lord, I need you. I can't do this without you.
where you are. Where you are. conversation so hard to have. That baggage that just sits in our hearts, Lord, that makes it so hard to just share what's in our hearts because along with all the things that might be good, sometimes the ugly stuff comes out too. Sometimes the resentments that we take out on each other, God, they're not even, they're not even about each other really hurt at somebody else, but we, we don't know how not to take it out on each other. God, save us. Save us from ourselves. Save us from our weak spots. Save us from our blind spots, God. Save us from the broken places, Lord, that cause us to hurt and be hurt.
for the ways that you are speaking to us today, Lord God. Lord, I know there may be some hard hearts in this room who even now are have already decided that they are not going to do anything with this. God, I pray that you would send us on our way today and that this would be, this message today would be like a rock in our shoe. That we can't quite shake, we can't figure out because you keep speaking to us, God. Because you want us to be healed. Because you don't want any more walls between us and you, between us and each other. Lord, save us. Lord, heal us. Lord, we need you. Thank you, God, that you are a God who saves and a God who heals. I ask for your blessing over every person here and every family that's represented here, Lord God. Would you send us out into this world, Lord God, not to point fingers or to drum up old hurts, Lord, but to be healers, to be visionaries, to see what it is that you are doing in this world, and to bring your hope, and to bring your light, to bring your truth and your love wherever we go. We know in order to do that, Lord, it needs to start right in our own hearts, Lord God. So send us out with confidence, with our heads held high this world that so needs, desperately needs your healing. Thank you, God, for what you are saying to us today. We pray all these things in the matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and everyone said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Love you all. See you soon.